Rob and Katie in the morning. everybody welcome to our last monday podcast for a while oh, it's crazy but i made it i'm on site <laughs> and uh, this is coming out july 5th it's actually saturday july 3rd right now and i'm here to speak at the Connolly chapel tomorrow uh so we wanted to do this live so let's get one more live uh stream in so i know that we've been doing it via kind of like a zoom like type of thing and that's been working okay but it's good to be uh here on campus with katie so katie's gonna let us know what's coming up as we get into this busy summer season so guess what starts sunday oh my goodness <laughs> yeah so um yeah six days from when you're viewing this starts our 98th summer conference season yeah. which is crazy Man. and i'm really excited it's my third summer here and wow. i'm like really excited that to went see. quick at three i know oh my goodness i know um so family week number one is july 11th through the 16th with dr frank cerrone and dr roger wilmore which is really cool mm -hmm. and um our second family week is with dr roger peterson and dr ed hardesty and that'll be july 18th through the 23rd and we still have availability those weeks the awesome. rest of the weeks are pretty booked nice so for the first two weeks if you're a first time keswick guest you get 50 percent off a room with a hall bath which like awesome. that's pretty cool that's right sweet. Yeah. So if you would like to book your stay, you can call 1-800-453-7942. And we would love to have you. Yeah, we really would. And yeah. especially if you've never been here before or spent a week for the summer. I know some, a lot of you have probably been on like weekend retreats and things like that. You got to stay for a whole week mm -hmm. to see what, what the summer staff can do. Uh, see the colony guys just do a bunch of different things around campus. Uh, you know, you'll get to great music, great yeah. preaching, and just a great time to spend with your family. Uh, just away from everything. It's just a great campus. And if you're local, you can come and uh, sit in on the sessions for free nice and those are at 9 30 in the morning mm -hmm. and seven o'clock at night that seems about yeah. right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you she'll, would think i would know <laughs> yeah. she'll check the itinerary but, but uh yeah, yeah you gotta come you gotta come on campus um you know so the podcasts are going to be ending this week as we get into the busy season but everything's going to be live streamed on, on keswick on facebook and on boxcast and yep. youtube and so you'll be able to see what's going on in the summer so hopefully in the fall we'll have some new podcasts coming out for you i think we're going to keep our monday slot uh so we're really excited about that but today we're going to be finishing up our series on what would you do and today we're going to be talking about the apostle paul all right so let's get into acts chapter 20. so today we're in acts chapter 20 and we're talking about the apostle paul and what we're going to talk about is just how Paul had to learn how to trust and to obey in some of the, the weirdest circumstances ever. Paul's desire was to get to Rome. And the way that he was gonna get to Rome was to get to Jerusalem and probably be arrested and then sent up the chain of appeals courts to get there. And so Paul understood something that uh, I think some of us, we, we, we miss, that you and I have to learn that we serve God no matter what the outcome. I'll say that again. You and I need to learn how to serve God no matter what the outcome is. Just think about that for a second. The example of, that he'll show the Ephesian leaders is that Paul has this faithful commitment that has this assured confidence that I think sometimes escapes us. So here's what I want us to see. I want us, like the Apostle Paul, to just... Realize that we have to accept things that we often don't know what the exact outcome is going to be, but that following God is always the right choice, even if we don't know the steps ahead of us. That God is going to be with us no matter what course He takes us. Now, if we decide to go our own way, then we can't count on God to, you know, you know, continue to bless where we're going. This is why we follow the way that God leads us. And so we're in Acts chapter 20, and we're going to read verses, um, let's, go, let's go 17 to 38, okay? So Acts 20, verses 17 to 38. The Bible says this, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said, You know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and during the trials that came to me through the plot of the Jews. You know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable 
or from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testify to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions await me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the grace of, the, of, of God's grace, the gospel of God's grace. And, that, and now I know that none of you among whom I went preaching about the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years I never stopped warning each of you with tears. And now I commit to you, to God and to God, the, the word of this grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and those who are with me. In every way I have shown that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were many tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see him again. And they accompanied him to his ship. So Paul, he summons the elders of Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus is the place where Paul spent the most time. He'll say it, that he spent three years with this church. And he summons the elders, the leaders, the pastors of this church to come. And when they came, he starts telling them, he starts recording how he first came to them and how he stayed with them the whole time and how, he, how they served the Lord together in, in humility and that there were tears and that there were trials and there was this plot that was coming against him, uh, the Jews trying to kill him. And you know that in the middle of all these trials and all these things that he went through, Paul continued to, to proclaim only the truth what, from the word of God. And he did it publicly and he went from house to house. He didn't only preach to Gentiles. He preached to Jewish people. He preached about the repentance to God through Jesus Christ. And in the middle of all this, Paul says, with this humility, with, with the things, that this glimpse into the heart of the Apostle Paul, he says that now he is compelled. The Spirit is telling him that he needs to go to Jerusalem. Now, now think about this for a second. There's already plots pl that the Jews are, are putting out there to kill the Apostle Paul. And what would be the center of Judaism? Jerusalem. Where was the first big persecution? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There were other churches sending money to the church of Jerusalem because they were suffering. Jerusalem is not the place that you'd want to go if you have uh, a, a clear message of the gospel because you're going to get captured. You're going to suffer. And Paul says this is what God wants him to do. And he's telling them, listen, I served God here at Ephesus. I came because God told me to come. And just like God told me to serve you for three years, now it's time for me to move on. And so he says, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen when I get in Jerusalem. All I know is the Spirit is telling me wherever I go, wherever I preach, wherever I share, he keeps telling me, the Spirit of God tells me, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to have afflictions. And this is in God's will. Guys, it is very possible to be in the center of God's will and to suffer. It is very possible to be in, in, engulfed in, in afflictions and trials and be in the center of God's will. If any pastor, if any blog, if any, if any televangelist, if anyone tells you that only people who are sinning are the ones that suffer, it is a lie from Satan. Our biggest moments of learning is when we are in the midst of trials because this is where we get to see God work. This is where we get to see ourselves refined. Afflictions, trials. And Paul says, this is, this is what's going to happen. 
And he says, my goal is not to escape affliction. My goal isn't to have a life that's just going to be uh, hunky-dory, everything fine. He said, my life, my goal is to finish the course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of God's grace. He says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to go through things. But in the middle of all that, my goal isn't to get out of suffering. My goal is to continue to preach Jesus. You know, a lot of the suffering and afflictions that we go through are self-appointed. We say things, we do things, we think things that dishonor the Lord. And we suffer. And the reason why we suffer a lot of times is because we've done things wrong. But do you know, even in the midst of that, in the midst of coming to terms with who we are and understanding that we've hit our rock bottom and that we're powerless to change the, our character defects, when we get to that place where we realize that our life has now become unmanageable and there's nothing that we can do, and we finally cry out to the highest power in the universe, do you realize that God even uses the suffering that we created to show us that our purpose in life is to share Him and to serve Him? And Paul he says, this is what it's about. I don't, I love the way he puts it. I don't want to avoid declaring to you the whole counsel of God, the whole plan of God. But he says, hey, as I'm doing this, as I'm suffering, I want you to remember that there are people out there who are going to try to come in and, and try to ruin what God is doing. And so elders of Ephesus, you have to be on guard. As I'm being on guard and allowing things to happen in my life, I want you to be on guard, not, not for someone who's going to persecute, but somebody's going to come in and try to steal the sheep by teaching the wrong things. Paul's life, he says it all the time about these false teachers that are coming in, and he calls them these savage wolves. No one will be spared. These men will come in and try to take sheep away, to take believers away into false doctrine. He says men will rise up, he says, even from inside your own church to distort the truth. So he says, be alert night and day because I want you, just like I've been telling you from the beginning with tears, this is what's going to happen. So Paul's saying, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to go away. But while you guys are here, be on guard for the flock. And then he tells them, and now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. He says that the word of God shares that you'll have this grace, this, this supernatural enabling, this unmerited favor to do what you need to do, which is able. Here's what the grace of God is able to do, to build you up, to construct you into a way that you understand the inheritance that you have because you are sanctified. You're set apart. And because you're set apart, you have the ability and the grace to be built up. And he says, one of the things that separates him from the others that will come in and try to ruin the church is that he never asked for money. And you think, why is this coming up? And the reason why it's coming up is because Paul was obedient to the point that he even realized that him taking money from a church, like on a salary basis, would bring disshame because people would say he's only doing it for the money. So Paul actually had another job. He was a tent maker. He had another source of income so that he would never take money from these churches. And these false prophets, they wanted to be paid. They wanted to come in and be paid like these scholars. They wanted to be paid like the Pharisees when they would visit other towns, be put up in these big houses and, and given these honorariums and things like that. He goes, I'm glad I never did any of that because how he wants to show them that when that when we help people by working, this is when Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so he wants them to know one of the things that I want you to realize is that obeying God includes sacrifice, and sometimes it includes you working on multiple fronts in order to make things work, in order to make sure that the gospel remains pure. And this is a crazy moment, and, I, and it brings me to tears to think about Paul talking to the elders and now kneeling with them and praying, and there's all these tears, and, and they embraced him. But this is what shows that Paul's obedience now has transferred to the next generation. Here's what it says. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that he, they'd never see him again. They turned from being fearful about or, or, or the fear of Paul being captured or being tortured when he goes to Jerusalem, being the, 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 the supreme issue at hand, they were going to miss him. 
And so now there's more of this emotional tie to continue on in what they've learned instead of we're going to be worried about Paul. So obeying God is not just for you. Obeying God isn't isn't for God because God's will is going to happen no matter what. Obeying God shows that we believe. But you know what obeying God does? It shows other people what it takes to show that they believe. You see, we're, we don't have a work salvation that our obedience is what is what gives us our faith. Our faith, ca- faith causes us to obey. And so this obedience to Paul, even uh, obedience to God that Paul had, even to the place that he was going to suffer for it, is the hallmark of what it means to understand what would we do? What would we do when it came down to following God or having an easier life? You know, trusting God and not knowing the outcome. It's a tall order. It's not easy to think about. But my friends, trusting God over comfort leads to this vibrant walk that allows us to show other people what it really means to follow and fall in love with Jesus. So in Acts chapter 20, we saw that the Apostle Paul uh, was encouraged uh, to trust God and obey him. And like, you know, we know this. Obedience is the way that we show that we believe. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, that's literally what shows our faith is that we obey. And so Paul was about to go, like we read, going into Jerusalem. And he was talking to the Ephesian elders, just getting them ready for this big journey. And uh, so we're going to go through our our small group questions just for us to think about it. If you have anything to add, you can put it in the comments below on this thread. So first question, what we got? So it's a long one. Okay. The Apostle Paul longed to serve Christ as fully as possible. How would he be able to do that by leaving and heading to Jerusalem? How difficult do you think it would have been for him to leave the Ephesian elders in charge as he followed God's leading? So the the whole point of Paul, Paul wanted to get to Rome. That's what he endeavored to do. Before he started going to Macedonia, Paul was heading east and God stopped him in this city called Bithynia. And he tells him, then he gets this Macedonian dream. Someone says, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul goes to Macedonia, the complete opposite direction, and we see major people get saved. The Philippian jailer, uh, Lydia, and all the churches of Philippi get started, and all these churches begin to thrive. Then Paul gets this clear sign that the idea that God wants him to head towards Jerusalem. Now why? Jerusalem's not the goal. It's to get to Rome. Because if he gets if he goes to Jerusalem, that boy's getting arrested. Mm-hmm. And everybody was worried about this thing. Dude, why are you going to Jerusalem? You can stay here. Ephesus were booming. The church is going great. It's like, no, my job is to get, I want to preach to Caesar's household. I want to get, I want to get in front of government. I want people to realize who Jesus is. His, he understood how big his task was. And so for him to not go to Jerusalem would be to be hindering what God wanted for his life. But at the same time, there is this burden for the Ephesian elders. Like, you know, um, it had to have been hard. I mean, the, he was there. He spent the most time at Ephesus. This is the church that, that we get. So the letter to Ephesians is where we hear about what it means to be predestined. It's mm-hmm. where we hear about how God's sovereign grace saved us, how he chose us. That's all that deep, rich scripture that we wrestle with mm-hmm. was written to this church because they could handle it. Mm-hmm. That's that church that he's about to leave. Think about that for a second. Yeah, right? I got this great church, and why, why would I be moving on after that? Because this was his call. So, but the way you know, the way Paul is, Paul's very meticulous in how he sets things up. He tells them that they have to have elders, that they have to get going. He he appoints elders. He makes sure that they're affirmed before he leaves. And so, even though the task was rough, he made sure that him, that himself, and also the church was ready for this transition. Yeah. So the next one. Could Paul's charging the leaders of Ephesus to be good shepherds be a challenge for you to entrust your own work to others when you need to do so in order to follow God? So being a good shepherd should end up with you leaving other shepherds to take on, Mm -hmm. right? So if I'm a shepherd and I'm watching sheep and I'm great at it, that's not as important as me training the next generation of shepherds to take care of sheep. Because there's always going to be a flock. There's always going to be someone coming after us. And so good leaders don't just lead people. Good leaders then develop other leaders. And so Paul's greatest um, 
just gift wasn't just him preaching the gospel, it was teaching other people to preach the gospel. And that's, remember, that's what our, our call is, is not just to be good Christians, it's supposed to be, we're supposed to be reproducing Christ followers, mm -hmm. that we make disciples that then go on and make disciples. And so this is his, um, his, his shepherding was to shepherd people to also become shepherds. And so that's, that's an encouragement for me and for other people that, how do we know we did well? is that when we move on to the next place, people are uh, now leading where you were leading. So that, that's how that works. So according to the passage, what was Paul's greatest challenge in the unknown path ahead? So he says in Acts 20, he literally says that in this journey that he doesn't know what's going to happen, he says that he's getting uh, the Holy Spirit is warning him in every town. This is what he's hoping and he's praying that with chains and afflictions, that's what's waiting for him. So his greatest challenge was to continue to go on knowing his life is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Like he literally, I mean, honestly, like he has the church telling him stay. He has the Holy Spirit's going, this is the way to go. But by the way, bud, it's going to be chains and afflictions. So, you know, just like um, he kind of had that, that cry, like, you know, not to let the cup pass from him continue on making sure that he's preaching. And so for him, the greatest challenge was to continue on this path. Mm -hmm. So what ministry did Paul end up doing after he said goodbye to the leaders? How does this challenge you that only God knows the future? So he goes from Acts and, and, and from this chapter and chapter, and he starts heading towards uh, Jerusalem. Um, you, you, you see so many things happening on this path that leads to Rome, but everything, even if you read this last missionary map of this journey, he continues to go towards Jerusalem. He continues to see people come to Jesus. He continues to see, um, you know, the, the elders of Ephesus just rally around him and pray over him. He starts to see fruit for his labor. He starts to see his companions continue in the midst of, of, of these chains and afflictions, continue to follow him, continue to be with him, and people continue to come to know Jesus in the midst of all that. So, mm -hmm. like, it's kind of like in the, like, God never promised to take away the chains and the afflictions, but he did promise that his will is going to be done and he's going to be glorified in the midst of this trial. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us, that's an encouragement that it's, it's not this prosperity gospel that if everything's great in your life, then you're on God's will. If things are going bad, it's because you've sinned. Sometimes the greatest lessons that we learn are in the valley. They're not on the mountains where we can yeah. see heights. It, it's in those low points. And so Paul really is shaped during this time. And then, I mean, because think about it. He's, he's going to be in prison. He's going to write most of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you, he, he has to be locked up for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So these chains and afflictions led to you and I getting saved. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Him writing that is what led for us coming to Jesus. It, it's what his writing is what hitches a lot of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this is a really learned man. But he's, you know, you got to think about it. Paul is, his entire life, this zealot. And so now to be zealous in writing instead of zealous in like preaching, it's a pivot. Yeah. But he does it. Yeah. And it's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I feel like that's, uh, you know, we've, been, we've entitled this series, you know, what would you do? You know, and so what would you do when it comes down to following Jesus or not? Does that really make a difference in your life at all? Is our life about following the word of God or is it just like we make these decisions, you know, just, just willy nilly. If we feel great, hey, we're going to follow Jesus. If not, we're not going to do that. It all, we all do what we want to do. But if we just make that conscious choice that whatever we're going to do is to glorify God and to obey what his word tells us and obey what the spirit says based on the word. This is the way to the growth. This is the path like Paul takes to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. We're going to miss you guys. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to see you all summer online and then uh, continue uh, uh, commenting on the thread. Uh, you know, you can always reach out to Keza with prayer requests. Uh, you can friend us both on Facebook and we'd love, we'd love to chat with you. Um, but, hey, have a great summer and uh, we'll see you in the fall. All right, God bless you.